The Nile, lifeblood of ancient Egypt and lifeblood of modern Egypt. Today we are exploring in the area known as Thebes, which is the ancient capital, and also home to the Valley of the Queens, the Valley of the Kings, the Ramesseum, the Colossi of Memnon, Luxor, and much, <clears throat> much, much more. This is Luxor Temple, but the focus of today's video is about Karnak. The history of Karnak, the Karnak complex, is largely the history of Thebes and its changing role in the culture. Religious centers varied by region, and when a new cap capital of the unified culture was established, the religious centers in that area gained prominence. The city of Thebes does not appear to have been of great significance before the 11th dynasty, and previous temple building there would have been relatively small, with shrines being dedicated to the early deities of Thebes. Now most of the construction that we're going to be looking at here is from the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom, such as these statues of sphinxes with ram's heads and all of this sandstone and limestone construction. But as always, the focus of the video will be anomalous structures that we see made out of much, much harder stone. Of course, the works of the New Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom are very impressive, but it's the aspects that don't fit into the picture of the dynastic Egyptians that will be our focus, such as this massive granite statue which you can see has catastrophic damage to it. Of course, it was damaged during times of conquest and plunder, but its actual creation is a mystery in that the dynastic Egyptians did not have the tools to be able to do grand works in hard stones such as granite. This is what remains of a giant obelisk broken into several sections. And the question is, what caused it to break? Was it simply an invading army that knocked it over? Or is there evidence of catastrophic damage from a time before the ancient dynastic Egyptians existed? Some of the surface weathering on the stone is not typical of the way the granite decomposes. It's sloughing off in layers, and that could be evidence of high heat striking the surface in the distant past. And then we have fascinating structures such as this. Originally, this was one piece of stone. The stone is called travertine, and it was originally one piece of stone and has undergone a lot of repair work. But originally, this one block of travertine would have weighed conservatively a thousand tons. And according to our geologist, there are no quarries in Egypt from which you could cut a 1,000 ton block like this. And it's her estimate that the quarry from which this stone came from is in Turkey. That's a very great distance to move such a huge piece of stone. Also notice the holes in the ceiling where probably giant doors were originally located that would open inwards. And as we continue to travel along in this area, you see the mud brick walls in the background and this curious structure that has been reconstructed. It was originally made of several very large pieces of stone. Quartzite, which is the reddish pinky colored stone, and then black granite. We'll come back to that one. 
But first I want to show you another one of these large travertine structures. Once again, originally this was one piece of stone and estimated weight probably minimum 500 tons and possibly 1,000 tons. And it again likely came from a quarry in Turkey. Here again, you can see the perfectly circular holes in the ceiling that probably would have been hinge points for two massive doors. And the hieroglyphics are not as finely done as the structure itself, so the hieroglyphics were probably added during the dynastic period. This is actually quite a common thing that we see in ancient Egypt, where the dynastic people adopted the older structures they found, probably repaired those that show uh, evidence of catastrophic damage, and then carved their hieroglyphics into them. Once again, the perfectly circular holes in the ceiling. And here, evidence of a saw. Now, during most of the dynastic period, the Egyptians had bronze tools, as in bronze saws and chisels, not steel. Steel came in most likely at a minimum around the 8th century BC. And now we're exploring that structure that we walked past previously. Once again, made out of relatively large blocks of quartzite and also granite. This very interesting tub, once again, has surface carving on it, but the original was likely not made by the dynastic people. It was an inheritance. And here again, we can see the perfectly circular holes as we saw in some of the other structures in the area. Now quartzite is located in general in Cairo, which is a fair distance away from this area of Karnak and Thebes, and granite in general came from the Aswan Quarry, which is in the southernmost part of Egypt. And now we're going to inspect this interesting staircase very precisionly put together and unlikely to be a modern creation, nor that from the dynastic period. It could once again be an inheritance from a much older culture that had advanced machining, lost ancient high technology. And as we inspect more, once again you see very finely fitting pieces of ancient stone. And this work could not have been originally done by the dynastic people, but was an inheritance. Now this is the dynastic area. Here again, we see giant pillars or columns made out of sandstone, which is a local material. But none of these columns are one piece of stone. There are several sections one on top of the other, and of course, covered in hieroglyphics. This is an amazing achievement by the dynastic people. But it's the other structures made of harder stone, which are of particular interest to us. Again, you see the sheer sense of scale of the dynastic works and of course the modern repair work done largely in concrete because this temple was destroyed likely many times after the dynastic period and possibly damaged during the dynastic period by invading armies. But now we're walking down towards what is called the Holy of Holies. This is the original core of Karnak and this is where we find the majority of the megalithic work which is of particular interest to us, aside from the large travertine structures we saw. This is one of the largest obelisks remaining in the world, and it's made of one piece of Aswan granite. Now, 
As has been said in other videos of mine, this could not have been originally the work of the dynastic people because they were incapable of working, on, uh, working with hard materials such as granite to such a fine degree like this. They of course did make sculptures and other things out of granite, but their finishing work was never as fine as this. So this is an example of a much older piece of work. And here again we find another saw mark cut relatively deeply into the granite, not something that could have been achieved during dynastic times, but a remnant of the much older, older culture. Here again we see another very fine saw mark. You cannot do work like this with a bronze saw. This would require something much harder. And now we're looking at what is called a core drill, or at least half of one. And this shows you the size of it. Now core drills were not invented as far as we know until probably the 1870s AD. And look how thin that core drill was. Here again, another very fine saw mark in granite. and another perfectly round core drill hole. When we look at it in detail, we can even see the feed rate or the penetration of the core drill. Now we're looking at some catastrophic damage. You can see that the surface of this once uh, pillar is basically, the material is uh, sloughing off, and it's believed that this was caused by a blast of very high heat in the distant past. We're now inside what is called the Holy of Holies, which is the core or center of Karnak. And again, you can see the walls are sloughing off. Again, likely the result of a blast of high heat, possibly plasma from the sun that occurred approximately 12,000 years ago, according to some experts such as Dr. Robert Schock and Dr. Paul Laviolette. I highly recommend their works. And now once again we're looking at some black granite and again you can see that the material is basically sloughing off and the cracking is not the result of normal weathering but expansion likely from the inside out as the result of a blast of very high heat. Karnak is one of the best examples of where we see evidence, or at least possible evidence, of ancient plasma from the sun striking different places on the earth here in Egypt and also in other locations such as Peru and Bolivia. Now here is some granite, again, which is degrading very badly. And this, once again, is not the result of standard normal weathering, but more likely the result of a blast of high heat. And a very large piece of travertine with two perfect drill holes and also catastrophic damage, which again, I believe is the result of high heat. So it's locations such as Karnak and also the Ramesseum and the Colossi of Memnon, which are all relatively close to one another, where we see strong evidence of ancient catastrophic damage that occurred prior to the time of what we call the, uh, the Pharaoh's or Pharaonic time span. Now once again we're looking at a very large statue made of granite where again the material is basically sloughing off. And then we see that the top half of the statue is simply not there whatsoever. Look at the high polish on the lower part of the leg. Again that type of high polish was not achievable during dynastic times because that requires very hard uh, and fine materials such as carborundum 
or diamond dust to be able to create such a high polish. And here again, we're seeing more sloughing off of the surface. Very large blocks of granite that lock together without mortar and more perfect drill holes. Now this was the first time we were able to walk through this section of Karnak. This was in April of 2019. Prior to that, as far as I know, <clears throat> this area was not open to the general public and it was filled with amazing ancient wonders. Look at the almost perfect flatness of this granite slab. Once again, almost impossible to achieve during dynastic times. And then a gray or black granite or cyanite or possibly even diorite statue that has literally been blown to pieces. Here again, you can see the high polish that would have been very difficult, if not impossible to have been achieved during dynastic times. And in this section, we're going to see some quartzite statues. Again, quartzite is a material that would have been very difficult for dynastic sculpt, uh, sculptors to work with. And the nearest quarry of quartzite of this scale is located in Cairo, which is quite a fair distance away. Each one of these statues shows not only catastrophic heat damage, but even melting, as you can see here. Since quartzite is very high in quartz, uh, when you apply high heat to quartzite, the material has a tendency of melting, which we saw at another location called Tanis in the Nile Delta. Once again, we see very large statues made of one piece of stone, where large sections of the statues have been obliterated. This is not likely to have been done by invading armies, but again, by ancient cataclysmic activity prior to dynastic times, taking us back into what the ancient Egyptians call uh, Zeptepe, or the first time, which describes the pre-dynastic period. So this was a relatively thorough visit to Karnak. This is one of 25 videos that I will produce from our trip in April of 2019, where we explored ancient Egypt, as well as Baalbek in Lebanon, and Byblos in Lebanon, and Petra, and Little Petra in Jordan. If you're interested to learn more about my work, this is one of my books located at Amazon.com in paperback and ebook format. If you want to meet me in person, I'll be at Contact in the Desert, May 31st to June 3rd at Indian Wells, California. If you'd like to explore with us, come to Turkey with us in September of 2019. And or Come with us to India to see the ancient machining marks located there at many different ancient sites. Or come with us in Egypt in March 2020. This tour will sell out very fast. If you're interested in any of these tours, please contact Patricia Lehman at chematology.com. And thank you for watching as always.